Lindbergh has a wonderful quote. Flying encompasses science, beauty, adventure, and freedom. And who could ask for more? Chuck Yeager described it as the right stuff. The movie Iron Eagle described it as the touch. But it's that magic that every pilot feels, the drive, the determination. You're going to have all sorts of problems in your business world. But once you get in the cockpit of the airplane, it's all gone. You slip the bonds of Earth and you're there soaring. And it's just magnificent to be up on a beautiful day. You feel free as a bird. flying since he first saw a bird catch the air's currents and soar. Only in our century has he made that dream come true. Now at last he can share that experience and taste the exhilarating freedom of flight. No one has described the feeling better than former test pilot and passionate philosopher of flight, Richard Bach. My first flight, I will never forget that inability to breathe as the ground dropped away and discovered that I could see the world through the eyes of that seagull who had enchanted me. I could personally not only touch but control that gift of flight. Flying has always been to me this wonderful metaphor. In order to fly, you have to trust what you can't see. up on the mountain ridges where very few people have been, I thought back to what every flyer knows, that there is this special world in which we dwell that is not marked with boundaries. That's not a map. We are not hedged about with walls and desks. So often in an office, the very worst thing that could happen is you could drop your pencil. Out there, there's the reminder that there are a lot worse things that can happen and there are a lot greater rewards. The sky is not man's natural element. In its defiance of Earth's gravity, flying an airplane must always be something of an adventure. Those who embark upon it are joining an elite club, a brotherhood of flyers. Cessna 195, you're cleared to runway 36 right. 36 right, you're cleared to land. Right. 
text of that long easy down there. We'll get him out of the way. You're behind by at least 3,000 feet. Give me good space all the way in. I need the base leg in tight so the power can pick you out on the base leg with your tight for the landing sequence. Okay, yeah. Uh, Six from my second. Black one towing a Voyager. I think I was cut out last night. on the left side, heading to the street. Airport, I like that one from my street. Star 126.6, please. Black one, I'm touched down. Black one, okay. All aircraft, off into the grass. I'll left turn into the grass. Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the private flyer's paradise. 15,000 aircraft fly in to take part in the greatest air show on earth. And for one week each year, it becomes the world's busiest airport. Nearly a million people come to the event, drawn by a passion for aircraft. Its celebrations, supermarket and circus all rolled into one. Climax is the flying. Right about in here they call for the smoke on. There goes the general half roll. Charlie now to the inverted flight position. His BF Goodrich aviator tires pointing up towards the sky. The wingmen with their tires pointing down towards the runway. For the pilots, flying is a love affair, and Oshkosh is its consummation. I grew up loving airplanes. I was uh, a small girl. I used to fly with my dad, who was an airline pilot. And um, as soon as I knew what an airplane did and what it was, I knew I was going to fly someday. You know, it's not so much of flying in front of crowds. I love the people. There's no question about that. But when I'm up there flying, there could be three people out here, or 30,000, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm up there trying to perfect maneuvers and uh, being that it's flown to music, it's like a ballet. A lot of pilots will sit over in the, in the tavern or something to talk about flying on the ground and there's something about it that's so indescribable that they relate it to sex, if you will. But it's a joy that you can't describe. It's a freedom that you feel when you're up there. You're, it's man and machine or woman and machine if you're person and machine. And uh, you're controlling that aircraft, making it do what you want it to do. And uh, it's just a joy. That it's hard to describe. every aviator is, well, it's been described in many ways. Chuck Yeager, in his book, described it as the right stuff. The movie Iron Eagle described it as the touch. But it's that magic that every pilot feels, the drive, the, the determination. The reason that every pilot flies is because flying is so free. It's so individual. Pilots recognize that magic. They recognize that in each other, and it, it's what does bind every aviator to himself. It struck me when I was first uh, taking flying instructions that flying and playing a musical instrument are very similar because they're balancing a lot of things at once and thinking about a lot of things. And I think that did help me with my flying. There's a lot of freedom and a sense of power with flying that you can also have with music. I remember the first
first year I was in a big symphony orchestra, the uh, conductor of the time, Joseph Cripps, a very famous European conductor, said uh, he wanted us to play as if we were escaping up into heaven, and he threw this wonderful, grandiose gesture up to the top of the music hall. And uh, I even remember thinking then that that was the same gesture I would have used if I was trying to describe what flying felt like. It's really an escape, and I think most pilots, myself included, feel that um, it's a very spiritual kind of an activity to carry on because you really are trying to reach into your own spirit and get out there and feel free and feel in control and feel in command, and it's just something wonderful that happens in the pit of the stomach. Pilots are like birds. Uh, where else can you get a chance to soar out there and experience the earth from above and feel that somehow you're beyond all of that humanity? You've got a, a kind of a special thing there, and uh, every pilot has that knowledge that they feel that way, and so therefore it kind of brings us all together. We're a family. They're very, very special people, and I think that uh, every pilot has a twinkle in their eyes, the special knowledge that they get from flying, the special feeling they get. And um, it's fun. It's just plain fun to fly. In this temple of aircraft worship, building your own machine is as important as flying it. Part of the ritual is the pilgrimage to the Oshkosh Fly Mart. Uh, I tell you the truth, sir, I think it may have come out of a small chicken house. I, I don't really remember. But for the price for a hundred bucks, you can't miss. Making it tough. I mean, just hold that thing. Just feel that. You can hold thing. that a minute. Well, this, this makes my heart throb right here now. Bearing sounds good. Thousand feet per minute. Maybe the other one would be better because the uh, uh, right here because the uh, markings there. What are you building? Well, I'm building a uh, tri Q, a Q2, but with a tricycle gear. Well, I'm going to try, but uh, I'm still looking for an engine. Oh, <laughs> well, we got them too. When you get home, we'll oh, yeah. call. Okay, I will. Parked across four square miles is the prized handiwork of thousands of do-it-yourself enthusiasts. So many aircraft home builders are lonely creatures, working alone in dark garages, and finally, one day after years of work, wheeling out this airplane. Oshkosh is that one glorious time when they let go of loneliness, and all at once they're together. And when they're together, it is the most astonishing event in all of aviation. And when you reach the top of a loop, do well, you at, have control? At slow speeds, you have control, but it's uh, wallowing. Yeah. It's not very positive. When you personally take some sheets of cloth or sheets of aluminum and a handful of rivets, you put these together and it flies, there is something that cannot be shared with anyone who hasn't done this. Did you say when? Okay, let's do it. There we go. Frank Bates and Dwayne Bunker are typical of the breed. They spent three and a half years lovingly building their own aeroplane. Good. 
sure fits a lot easier nowadays. Yeah. Than it used to. Yeah, your side goes in first. But well, we started off building it in my garage. The plans are very detailed when you start out for the construction. They get less detailed as you go along because they figure you're supposed to be learning something as you go. I'd do the mechanical part of the work, and Frank would look at the plans and, and keep me straight and, and keep everything going. And so it worked out very well. Wow, that slips in the way it's supposed to. That's the way it's supposed to go. It took us a lot longer to build it than we thought it would. <laughs> it looked like a pretty simple thing when you started it, but it's uh, it's pretty complicated when you really get into it. Okay, I got one more. Well, we've spent, I'd say, 10,000 hours building it. The point to where you're getting close to flying when everything is coming close to an end and you realize that pretty soon you're going to be going up in this thing, uh, everything gets a little bit more important. <laughs> so, but the last minute, I had to test fly it. <laughs> so that kind of uh, put a little more importance on it. I think we took another month after you told me I was going to test fly it. <laughs> get that in. I mean, get it right, right side up. I want to fly it upside down. She goes. Okay. okay, master's on. Let's see if she'll fire up now. You have to have a goal uh, in okay, mind. You have to have this line. dream that, my George, you know, it can be done. You just have to more. have that self-confidence that it will result in a flyable machine. Uh, I think the statistics show that only 20% of the plans that are sold ever uh, result in a completed airplane. 80% are never finished and they, those dreams die on the uh, workshop floor. We finished ours, we're happy. To be able to get out there and construct something that uh, will actually perform like this airplane does, it's just a magnificent uh, sensation. There's no, no way to describe it. Uh, when you take that airplane and give it the power, give it the throttle, roll down the runway and pull back on the stick, and by George, she lifts, she flies. And you say, gosh, this is something I helped build. And uh, then when we think back about it, that, that's quite an accomplishment. Dwayne said it's a, it's a chance to show off. It's his graduation day. It's the coming out party. It's the debutante's ball. And you've got this beautiful thing that you want to display. And you're very proud of it. To me, it's a therapy. It's a cleansing of your soul. And you get up there and cloud dance and it's unfettered. It's a tremendous feeling of freedom. And as I uh, told my wife, it's certainly better than an analyst and far cheaper. You slip the bonds of earth and you're there soaring. It's just magnificent to be up on a beautiful day in a beautiful country flying. You feel free as a bird. people they are too but, but to, to bring your plane to Oshkosh after you've worked on it for three and a half years to build it and then to compare it with the other builders and see what uh, how your plane stacks up against the others and to, the joy of being able to do that to accomplish it uh, is just un unbelievable. Flying demands special skills. To fly an ordinary business aircraft in this way calls for an exceptional skill. It has made Bob Hoover a legend among pilots. 
I start out with shutting off both engines, treating the airplane as if it were a glider, diving steeply, building up sufficient airspeed to be able to convert the energy from the airspeed into maneuvering capability. So I'm able to go up and over the top, do a complete loop. Now converting the altitude to speed and then a 180 degree turn and land on one wheel and then the other and roll up right in front of the speaker's platform. All with the engines dead from the time I started out. But that's the energy management maneuver and I call it my salute to the space shuttle program because that's exactly what they have going for them is energy management. I don't think I possess any skill uh, that anyone else doesn't have. I've just had perhaps more of an opportunity, more of an exposure and have been fortunate enough to uh, survive a lot of situations that uh, many others weren't quite so lucky to have uh, made it. It's not how close you get to the ground, but how precise can you fly the airplane? If you feel so careless with your life that, that you want to be the world's lowest flying aviator, you might do it for a while, but then there are a great many former friends of mine who are no longer with us simply because they cut their margins too close. I had the Secretary of the Air Force, Gene Sukut, in the co-pilot seat. And he had the aft part of the airplane filled with generals. And he said, uh, Bob, can the airplane be rolled? And I said, yes, sir. And I rolled, and the generals were all having a cup of coffee, and none of them spilled a drop. And then I got so bold as to think that maybe I could even pour iced tea. So then we put it on film. Now the difficult thing to think about is try to pour backhanded to see it on, on camera. Believe it or not, you can see the horizon going around as the tea is poured into the glass. We have to trust what we can't see in so many things, particularly in aviation. It is our wish to move from here to there. And we make our reservation and we go to the airport and we see this aquarium of these machines coming down outside the double glass and landing and nosing into this tank where we are. And we see crew people down there servicing and, and walking on the wings. And you can walk down the spar of a 747 and it is like a sidewalk. It is like solid concrete. And if we believe what we see, we turn around and we walk out of the airport right then, knowing that it is impossible to lift 300, 600,000 pounds into the air. If we say, I believe in magic, and if we look very carefully, we look at the shape of that wing, and that magical shape, even though it's cast in solid steel, has enormous power. I've been told that the amount of lift on the wing of a 747 is the equivalent of a baby sucking on a straw. That tiny straw circle has that little pressure differential. There are just so many acres of it that it will lift that steel into the sky. If we choose to fly, nothing will stop us from flight. I remember years ago, I, I got a letter from Lynn Ripplemeyer, and she was in South Florida, and she was absolutely, totally, completely, concentratedly determined to fly, and nothing was going to stop her. And from her letter was this wave of intense desire, and I knew reading the words. I knew what she didn't know. I knew that she would make it, and that she would be an absolutely astonishing pilot. She is today, I believe, a captain on the 747. I was reading a lot of books by Richard Bach that uh, served as an inspiration in several ways. Uh, 
I wrote to him and told him that I really did want to learn to fly, and he helped out by sending me a check for $100 to start my airplane fund, into which went all my Christmas money and birthday money and anything I could put together. So after about four or five years, I guess, of uh, flying six months out of the year and working as a flight attendant, the rest of the year I had my licenses and was an instructor myself. I think the 747 is the most beautiful airplane I've ever seen, definitely that I've ever flown. Its size is amazing, but what is truly amazing to me is that somebody sat down and even drew a picture, came up with the thought that something that huge could get into the air. After two years of flying it, each time I walk up to it, it's, it's still awesome to think that, first of all, I'm going to get in there and be at the controls of it, and then that the thing's actually going to fly. She's my favorite. I like her. I think any 747 captain gets a real charge out of being in command of that kind of airplane. With all that power and feeling the engines rev up, uh, get ready to go, releasing the brakes, feeling that much push behind you, and then the acceleration is a wonderful feeling, especially in that airplane, because it's so smooth, it's so graceful. Uh, maybe she is the ultimate airplane. Most of the airlines have that as the airplane that the more senior people fly, which means she's the favorite. Captaining a 747 with four or 500 people behind you is no different than captaining a little Piper Cub all by yourself. As far as the responsibility goes, you're concerned about getting yourself and that piece of machinery safely and comfortably back down to earth. Maybe years ago, with the airplanes as heavy as they were cable controlled, there was a need for a physically strong person, man, to fly that airplane. But that's 40, 50 years ago. Since the use of hydraulics, and especially two and three people in the cockpit, that macho-ness is no longer needed. And along with it, maybe that macho attitude of, I'm gonna do this by myself, what we have often termed as the right stuff, is not what you want in a commercial airplane with a, a team of people at the controls. Flying can be an incredibly emotionally beautiful experience as well. There are things like uh, taking off in the morning with an overcast sky when everything down below is kind of gray and foggy. You can take off and break out maybe just two, three thousand feet above the ground, and it's blue and sunshine up above. It's a completely different world. And if you level out at that altitude, it's almost like a high-speed boat going over the waves of the water, but without the pounding. It's just very soft. The clouds give way. Imagine being in your office or in your home and having three walls of a room that you can see out and through those windows, you get to see the coastlines, the mountains, the farmland, sunrises and sunsets, cloud formations. And that window is seven miles above the ground. And that's, that's my workplace. That's my office. get addicted in a certain way. You, you miss it, you need it um, when you haven't flown for a while.
seven out of uh, three three zero now for two four zero. One twenty four, go ahead. I had the opportunity to take both of my grandfathers up in an airplane and realized that nobody in their generation had ever seen what you can see from an airplane, from getting off the ground. And it was, it was a wonderful gift to be able to give them, a gift of flight. I feel incredibly lucky that I found something that I love doing this much, that I almost need to give something back. Um, Richard Bach has a line in one of his books that those of us who fly have our debts to pay. It's easy to forget in the comfort of a modern airliner what it has cost to make flight seem so effortless. Flying still holds many secrets. Here at Edwards Air Force Base, the scientists and pilots of NASA are trying to unlock them. Their job is to find ways of improving aircraft. They are probing the edges of aeronautical knowledge, trying out tomorrow's science to solve today's mysteries. It's another part of flight's adventure. Okay. Randy, move the roll stick to the right decant and hold. Okay, release. But what begins on a computer will end up being tested by people. At the sharp end of the latest research project, the X-29, is test pilot Steve Ishmael. I am a member of a team that is looking at a collection of new technologies in this experimental airplane. We contribute to, to small pieces that extend our knowledge, certainly in the same fashion as, as people like the Wright brothers or anybody else that has contributed as much as that to, to aviation. I think uh, the spirit of uh, experimentation and, and even maybe a little adventure is still there. If there were no risks, it would probably not be worth doing. I certainly believe an airplane is capable of killing you. In that sense, I respect it. For 40 years, Edwards has seen men and machines pushed to the limits. Progress demands a price. And in flying, it's often paid for with the lives of the pilots who test experimental aircraft. When I came here almost 30 years ago, why, uh, test flying truly was a risky business. And I think right here at Edwards in, in those days, we probably had one aircraft accident a month. And now if we have one accident a year, it's been a bad year. In the olden times, why test pilots uh, didn't see any need to take care of themselves because none of us thought we were gonna live to be 30. Scott Crossfield was the first test pilot of the X-15. He believed that the danger was an acceptable risk. Risk is probably the only source of progress of getting somewhere. And certainly we recognize that here. Every man that came to this country 400 years ago took a huge risk. And look what's become of it. They, uh, all of history, we have really made the gains that we've made by taking risk. In our technical history, the risk has been uh, risk of life, risk of property, risk of resources, risk of money. The pilot who tested this experimental flying wing was Glenn Edwards. It crashed and he was killed. Edwards Air Force Base is named after him, and its street names honor other pilots who died. I can look at every street out here and tell you exactly how they got killed. Nine times out of 10, I was watching them. You become very callous. And we learned in combat that, hey, if you have no control over something, forget it. And that's the way you look at dead people. Just don't get caught, that's all. 
Don't get yourself in that position where you don't come home. You learn a few things, how instinct pays off when you're in a semi-conscious state and tumbling in an airplane with tremendous G-loads, high cyclic rates, and that's what you're trained to do as a test pilot. That we spin airplanes all the time, that's part of our job. The way most movies depict a test pilot who's getting ready to die, he's talking, you know, and he's running around. The BS, man, you don't do anything like that. You don't talk because it's a waste of time. And you don't run around the cockpit, that's a waste of time. You concentrate on saving your neck, that's what you do. And whatever's necessary to try to save yourself, that's what you do. And that don't include talking. So what Hollywood's idea of, you know, what goes on in the guy's mind, the last few moments in his life, Flashing, that's a bunch of crud. The risks test pilots must take sets them apart from other flyers. The special bond between test pilots is that you kind of have to share your experiences. Uh, if you run into something that uh, you think may have killed you, but you got away with it, you sure want to tell the other test pilot uh, about that experience so that he doesn't have to go through the same thing. There's a desire to try and improve airplanes, try and find out what their limitations are so that the rest of the guys you know, all have that information. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's probably an inner desire to fly the new and the, and the fast and exotic airplanes, and the test pilots get to do that first. has its own personality and its own characteristics and the fun thing about flying is to get a new airplane and learn what its personality is, learn to talk to it. And I think I learned that really from Chuck Yeager. I had the chance to fly with him a lot and uh, he communicates with airplanes and he is so smooth and so good that if I could ever fly an airplane like he could, I think I'd be satisfied. For all its risks, test flying keeps a hold on the pilots who do it. For them, Edwards at dawn will always be the most romantic place in the world. I don't think there's a pilot alive, uh, certainly not a guy that's been in test flying that uh, has been through Edwards that just wouldn't give anything to go back there and, uh, and have another tour. It really represents the ultimate in a flying environment. The weather is good, the dry lake beds around the area provide you all kinds of emergency landing areas, but uh, just the atmosphere, the air that's there, the, the motivation of all the people there to really keep poking and probing and finding new new things, finding where the limits are on airplanes, and it's an environment that is just, just ideal for a pilot.
When the teams at the frontiers of aviation science have done their work well, this is the sort of aircraft that emerges, Concorde. The initial rate declines about 10,000 feet a minute as you actually lift off. It's a fantastic performance. I mean, you've got 38,000 pounds of thrust out of four reheated Olympi engines, uh, taking an aeroplane which is probably down to 120 tons into the air. That's flying. The aeroplane is just like flying a fighter. Very precise, very sensitive to, to handle. Flies faster than a rifle bullet. It's exciting to sit at 60,000 feet and see the curvature of the Earth. It's exciting to sit at 60,000 feet and see the dark uh, of outer space. To have a horizon to horizon, 750 mile range. That's exciting. When you take off for New York in the dark and see the sun rise in the west, you know you're doing something slightly different. But you're catching the sun. What do you reckon the time will be for the diesel? Well, we're running uh, particularly west. On the log time, we're about uh, eight minutes down, so... Right. who sadly is now dead, uh, said, Brian, I'll, I'll show you that Concorde can do a complete barrel roll. And I said, come on, you're pulling my leg. He said, no, we'll do it. And so he climbed up to 15,000 feet, 350 knots, 10 degrees of pitch angle, and he did a complete barrel roll in it, just keeping positive G on all the way over. He said, I've been one way, Brian, you better unwind it. So I had to take it back the other way. And that, to me, was one of the most exciting things because it showed me what Concorde could do. We don't do it with passengers on, <laughs> of course. But it, it, the, the confidence that it gave me, not that I needed any more in the aeroplane, was enormous. You know, this, this magnificent ship could actually turn upside down and continue perfectly safely. Nothing fell off, no red lights, no instruments toppling, nothing. In the history of aviation, no other single vehicle has remained at the top of the stack for 10 years. Concorde has been there for 10, it will be there for another 10. To me, it is the epitome of excellence in aviation. This is the adventure of flight in its most potent form, the military display team. The red arrows show what aircraft and pilots in perfect harmony can achieve. But close to the wingtip is the possibility of death, and all around the unforgiving sky. When I was flying in the military, I was aware of air crashes in which there would not be just one hole in the ground, but two. Because we were taught, as a wingman, you fly the wing. You do not care whether the world is over your head or beneath you or on its side by that same position on the wing. Wherever your leader goes, you will go. And if the leader flies into the mountain, you are not even aware that the mountain is there. You 
your only world is that cockpit floating out there 26 feet away from you, that wingtip a foot and a half or three feet from your own fuselage. That bond of trust exists there and it doesn't exist with anyone else who hasn't had that experience. You're saying, I trust you, my life is in your hands, and you are trusting me because you could kill the leader just as swiftly. Simply, it takes a touch on the stick like that, and you're both dead. Danger and delight, the delicate balance that lies at the heart of flying's attraction. For the Italian display team, the Frecci Tricolori, one tragic day in Germany, the balance tipped. Earlier, their delight in flying had reflected the feelings of every pilot, brushing aside all thoughts of danger. Two months later, three pilots would be dead. To be with the Frecci Tricolori, live with Frecci Tricolori, is a, an adventure every day. It's something you dream about when you're a kid, something you, you think you'll never do because it looks so, so difficult. But then when you finally do it, you finally make it and you're doing it, it's uh, one of the most exciting experiences in the world. When I fly, I think like a bird. I feel free. I think if I born again, I want to live again, this experience. Fighter pilots are uh, trained in a way that uh, they need to do the job, you know, and you have to do it in, in the best way, always. You can't miss. You're trying to get the profession out of your flying, so it's more, you know, like you act as an artist more than as a pilot. I think you do something uh, very close to the limits, your limits and plane's limits, but I don't think I, I do something dangerous. I feel safe. I don't think there is any, any, anything that I'm supposed to worry about. I don't know about the other guys. I, I'm thinking that uh, these things will happen always to somewhere, someone else, not to me, you know. Every day when I fly, I'm never happy about my job, what I did in the plane. And every day I think I can do better. On the 28th of August, 1988, in Rammstein, West Germany, the precision faltered for a moment and the light turned to disaster. Over 60 people died. A terrible price to pay for the pursuit of flying excellence. Adventures bring risk, but without risk, there is rarely reward. From the earliest times, we have understood that. Icarus, in Greek mythology, flew too close to the sun, and 
died for his presumption. The ultimate adventure for us living in the pull of gravity is flight. What child has not dreamed of flying like a bird? It offers a limitless promise of freedom. This century has started to fulfill that promise. Because a few have taken the risks of flight, we all can share the rewards. In 1903, two brothers flew. Now the adventure is shared by many. What began as a 90-yard hop has brought man to the very edges of space. At last, we have shaken off the surly bonds of Earth and are reaching for the skies.